Now, I think endurance races are pretty cool. It's kind of two of the typical narratives combined into one. Man versus himself and man versus nature. In particular, I think ultra marathons are the most fascinating, pushing one's body to the limits. I don't know if you're aware, they actually have to like weigh them before and after to make sure they haven't lost too much fluid so they don't literally die while they're running ultra marathons. And one of my favorite ultra marathon athletes is this guy. This guy by the name of Cameron Haynes. Okay, this guy was an elk hunter who wanted to be a better elk hunter, so he started competing in ultra marathons and like doing very well at them. So you can see why a guy like me would like him. This is the guy who introduced Joe Rogan to archery elk hunting and hunts with them every year. Uh, this is an uh, incredibly talented athlete um, that has a big name in the world. So he's got this very successful YouTube channel, this following, and a podcast. And he was talking on his podcast about one of the best races he ever had. I forget the exact time he got, but it was, it, it was a very good race. And he said something that shocked the other people interacting with him on the podcast. He said, the first few miles, I felt terrible. He said, I could hardly keep running. I thought I was going to quit. Here's like one of the best ultra marathon runners in the world who is thinking about quitting. I never considered that he would ever even think about quitting and, and dropping out of a race and not continuing on. It surprised me to hear this omission from him. I just assumed running was easy. For him. And this is why I share his story with you this morning, because at times in life we feel like quitting. At times we consider abandoning our faith, we consider walking away, we consider turning to our idols. And so if we're going to survive as Christians, we have to learn how to live with endurance. And it's for this reason that we are starting our study today on the book of Hebrews. In short, the first Christians were tired of being Christians, even tired of following Jesus. The book of Hebrews is famous. It's famous for uh, comparing our journey in faith to that of an endurance race. Hebrews has taught many followers how to live with endurance. But before we start running, we have to know what the goal is. So let's pray as we get started. God, this journey through life, this journey following you, can lead to difficult, even exhausting times. Jesus said, in this life, we will have trouble. And when trouble comes, it wears us out, God. However, Jesus finished that line by saying, Take heart, I have overcome the world. So may your spirit fix our eyes on Jesus, so we too may overcome. Pour through me the gift of preaching that the endurance of Christ may be formed in our hearts. It's in the name of Jesus I pray. Amen. So Hebrews is probably the most mysterious book in the New Testament. Uh, there's a lot of things we don't know about Hebrews that we know about all the other New Testament books. Like who the author was that wrote the book and who the exact audience was. We don't know those two things about this book. The only thing we know about the book of Hebrews is what Jesus' favorite kind of coffee was. Hebrews. <laughs> there's your lame Bible joke for the day. I'm sorry, no more of those. But in all serious, we do know a couple things. A couple things about Hebrews. Uh, one is that its style is different from all the other epistles. Uh, all the others are a letter, a letter written to a church on instructing them on what to do. But Hebrews is different. Hebrews is an exhortation, which is a fancy word for saying Hebrews is a sermon. And it's much longer than any of my sermons. 
So you can be thankful that we're not going through all of it today. Amen. Yes. <laughs> Second is the book of Hebrews was written to Hebrew Christians, Jewish Christians, who were struggling. They were completely exhausted. They didn't know if they could put one foot in front of the other without dropping out of the race completely. They were struggling with keeping going. They were struggling with not quitting. They, these were Christians from many years around. 60 years after Christ's birth to 100 years after Christ's birth. So they were the second generation of Christians. The persecution was intense. Many of the first eyewitnesses, the things that the people that witnessed the things that happened in the Gospels, they had uh, died. Many of them had died as martyrs. And so they were the, really the first generation who were believing the stories that were passed down to them. And they were considering giving up. The term we would use to describe them today would be called burnout. And the biggest temptation for them was to just go back to Judaism. The majority of the people around them still practice Judaism, family, friend, co-workers, um, and neighbors. The temptation was, man, it would just be a whole lot easier to just fit in, to just go back to Judaism, to just be like everyone else. And here is where Hebrews has something for us today. Because isn't that still our temptation? The persecution is nowhere near as intense. But the desire to fit in is just as strong as it ever was. I was reminded of this a week ago today. We were playing at the park with one of Silas's best friends. We were just hanging out and his best friend said to him, I'm standing there, Hey, my dad doesn't want you to come to my birthday party. Because you and your family are Christians. And my dad doesn't want me hanging out with Christians. Silas was a trooper about it. He crushed me. I'm like, oh, that's how we're going to be in this town? This is what we're going to be known for? This is how our family is going to be treated? And the temptation was to think, well, how could we just fit in? How could we just fit in and no one notice who we were? It was the same temptation they faced hundreds of times of years ago. Are we going to live like everyone else? Are we going to do the same things that everyone else does? Are we going to be accepted by our peers? It's always just as strong as it's always been. So this book has a great deal to say to us. A great uh, things to be said. But the question is, what advice do you give? What advice do you give to these people that are struggling? Do you give them some encouragement? Do you give them some strategies on how to move forward? Or maybe you tell them, hey, you know what? You just need some vacation, some rest. Everything will be okay. A Christian counselor or a counselor would say, maybe you need to set appropriate boundaries in relationships. The spiritual answer would be to say, hey, pray and read your Bible more from a ministry perspective. We'd say, well, how can we grow in relationships with each other as a church? How can we lean on each other? But this is how the start of Hebrews opens. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets and many times in various ways. But in these last days, He has spoken to us by His Son, whom He has appointed heir of all things, and through Him He has also made the universe. The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of His being, sustaining all things by His powerful Word. After he had provided purification for the sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. So he became as much superior to the angels as the name has inherited is superior to theirs. Now I must acknowledge from the start, this is in the top three introductions of any book in the Bible, okay? Genesis 1, John 1, Hebrews 1. It is this powerful phrase. It is the, the sublime description of Jesus here is breathtaking. But the strategy is perplexing. From the start, the preacher of the book of Hebrews 
doubles down on Jesus. He preaches, you know, to the congregation about these complex theological terms, about the nature and meaning of Jesus. Back then and even now, it might seem that the preacher's approach is out of phase. It's counterintuitive. It's in a, the violation of the notion of thinking, oh, they can handle, the congregation can handle all these complex thinkings. It's like the kid in church, when you ask him a question, he just says, Jesus. <laughs> oh. Okay, we could have seen this coming. We're struggling, and you're going to tell us more about Jesus. We already know about Jesus. But the courageous thing, if we have the eyes to see it, is the beauty is that is that Jesus is exactly what we need. Jesus is the answer. And in fact, Jesus is described as the exact being of God. We have proof that Jesus was the first clone here, I think is what we're seeing. I mean, think about what we do with our kids. We say how kids, children's qualities, we talk with each other, how they might favor one of the two parents, you know, different qualities about them. Or if you're anything like Aubrey and I, you take credit for all the best qualities in your children and you blame the worst quality on your spouse, right? Okay, maybe you guys are better at us than that. So you can help us answer the question who asks and takes after then. But Jesus is different. In fact, Jesus, the author of Hebrews is trying to explain uh, who Jesus is by talking about this ancient casting system. Okay, uh, They didn't have scanners or printers or, or uh, photography back then. These stamps or casting that they had was uh, a way to make money, to make coins. Do you remember when we used to buy things with coins? I don't remember that either, actually. <laughs> But coins are a carbon copy of each other. Um, and the quality the, that, that Hebrews is trying to explain to us is that Jesus is the exact copy. I think we even have a picture of it here, of these ancient casting systems. Did we already go past that? Of these stamps? Yeah. These are what these actual stamps looked like. On the left, you see an ancient version. On the right, you can see a replica of how they would use these stamps to actually copy this money so they were all identical to each other. And Hebrews started off by saying, God and Jesus, they're equal. They are just like each other. Specifically, Jesus' radiance and power is what makes him like God. In other words, it's his character. The character between God and Jesus, there is no different. difference. So the sermon starts by exalting the name of Jesus. And this is because there is a new temptation for Hebrew Christians. They were seeking to make Jesus just one of the angels. Jesus seemed great, powerful, and he seemed to do some amazing things. But angels seemed to do the same thing, too, if you looked in the Bible. They wanted to water down Jesus because God in the flesh seemed too good to be true. And since the beginning, this has been the temptation to do with Jesus. Today, the same things are said about Jesus. Jesus is described as being a philosopher, a teacher, a prophet, or that he promotes a good way to live. Gandhi in recent years made this line of thinking very trendy. However, it's a terrible argument if you look at it. Because if you read anything Jesus has to say and the claims Jesus makes, you'd be weird, you'd be foolish to follow his teachings and ascribe them to being good, but not to follow him as God's son. Um, so from the start, the preacher wants us to know that Jesus is all-powerful and is ruling over all things. But for now, for now the Hebrew sermon must go down the wormhole as he addresses this angel issue. Don't you hate it when preachers do that? In sermons? <laughs> for to who, which of the angels did God ever say, you are my son? Today I have become your father. Or again, 
I will be his father and he will be my son. And again, when God brings his firstborn into the world, he says, let all God's angels worship him. In speaking of the angels, he says, he makes his angels spirits and his servants flames of fire. But about the Son, he says, Your throne, O God, will last forever and ever. A scepter of justice will be the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God has sent you above your companions by anointing you with the oil of joy. He also says, In the beginning, Lord, you laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you will remain. They will all wear out like a garment. You will roll them up like a robe, like a garment. They will be changed, but you remain the same, and your years will never end. To, to which of the angels did God ever say, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool at your feet? Are not all angels, angels ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation? So the Hebrew writer starts off by making a logical argument. Seven times he quotes the Old Testament. Six of them are Psalms. And all these citations are messianic claims. Claims not only to the authority of Jesus as the King of Kings, but also claims to the divinity of Jesus. But his argument is so much more than just logical. Have you ever listened to those radio shows when they play the game on the radio show where they play just a few lyrics from a song? And you have to guess what song is being played. That's what Hebrews is doing in this sermon here. The hymnals, the psalms, that was the ancient hymnal for the first Christians and the Jews before that. So when they're hearing things, they're thinking of these psalms that are being cited. They're wanting to sing along with them in their heart. And the final nail in the coffin is Psalms 110. It was the most popular song or worship song to the early church. They probably, when they heard this part, were tempted to interrupt the sermon and sing the whole thing right at that very moment. Or maybe the preacher sung it to them when he read it to them. I won't sing to you guys the sermon. It's a deal I can make with you all there. No one wants to hear that. And that's what's happening here. They're hearing this, and they're, this, this psalm is this beautiful psalm to help them understand the role Jesus has in creation and his authority in the world. And so the chapter ends with a rhetorical question. Not all angels are ministering spirits to, send, to serve those who will inherit salvation. In other words, angels are the ones just sent in crucial moments. Are they, no, they are not the king, they are servants of the king. The king is something different. But I get it. Angels are cool. I mean, especially if they look like John Travolta, right? <laughs> we have this fascination with angels. And I think something, it's the same part of our brain that is drawn to superheroes. We love the stories of angels and the all-powerful things they do in the Bible. But... If you look closely at the stories of angels showing up in the Bible, people are actually terrified when they show up. They're like, whoa, it's a giant freak out moment because their power is so overwhelming. And the temptation they faced back then is the same temptation they, that we face today. Well, we can just water down Jesus a little bit. And we don't have to listen to all of his teachings. We can settle for a little less than Jesus. We can settle for a little less grace or a little less mercy or whatever category we might choose to water down Jesus in. Because it's so easy to be dissatisfied with what we have. We want to expand our spiritual horizons. We want to study different things like angels or saints or other interesting distractions to us. And if we really look at our lives, we do this in all areas of our lives. I mean, some people settle for artificial sweeteners. You know what's better than artificial sweeteners? The real thing! And you know what's better than the real thing? 
soda with like cane sugar in it. Ooh, if you ever had that, that is delicious. And you know what it, uh, it is better than almond milk? Regular milk! It's better! And do you know what's better than rice flour or potato flour or ground up nuts? Glutinous! It's so much better. And do you know what restaurant is better than Romeo's? Patio Pancake! Okay. Maybe I went too far there. Maybe I went too far. So often we settle for off brand Jesus. And Hebrews from the beginning reminds us. Oh, the real thing, if you look closely, the real thing is so much better. Jesus is so much better than angels. I love how John Mac MacArthur puts it in this quote. He says this, This Jesus Christ is the star of astronomy, the rock of genealogy, the lion and the lamb of zoology, the harmonizer of all discord, and the healer of all diseases throughout history. Great men have come and gone, yet he lives on. Herod could not kill him, Satan could not seduce him, death could not destroy him, and the grave could not hold him in. That is who the author of Hebrews tells us to focus on today. And so I want to talk about what this looks like in our world. How we could settle for off-brand Jesus. I told you before, one of the most influential books of last year in Christianity was the book called The Great Dechurch. See, for years we've known people have been leaving church, but we've been seeking to understand why. And the speculation has always been about big things like secularization in college, partisan politics, social issues like LBTQ+. And so this book sought to do the research of what's really going on and present it to us. And surprisingly, while all those other things did have influences, they weren't the number one thing. The number one reason why people dropped out of church was different forms of complacency. They were things like, we got out of the routine of going to church. We got out of the habit. COVID hit and we just never went back. Or it's the biggest one is we moved. We moved to a new town or city and we just never got plugged in or invited anywhere. Other things went on like club sports, like hobbies and all these different hobbies that we have and different forms of recreation that get in the way of us focusing on our faith. And so maybe you can see in that that we're really not all that different than the Hebrews church. We have our same issues, our same temptations. Our friends, our family, our co-workers pull us in all kinds of different directions, pressuring us to fit into different worldviews and ethics. And so the challenge, the challenge has always been the same thing, to keep the main thing the main thing. And the main thing, as cheesy as it might have sounded to them when they first heard it, and as cliche as it might sound to us today, the main thing is always Jesus. And so almost all runners, before they race, know the goal. I mean, racing is kind of rigged, right? There can be some, some things that, that hit like heat or you, you don't pace yourself right. But generally, when you're lining up to do a long distance race, you're shooting for a certain time. And you know the splits, the mile markers of what you need to do to achieve that, that time. For example, in my early 20s, I decided I wanted to do the Pikes Peak Ascent, the race from the bottom of Pikes Peak to the top of Pikes Peak. And in order to even participate in the race I had to have qualifying times in qualifying races so it was a three year journey of training and I knew all along that if I'm ever going to run this race I need to run within these certain parameters but do we live our faith like that do we have a strategy with our faith are we that intentional with our faith? Are we as serious about our faith as we are our workout routine? Because it's so easy in life to fix our eyes on anything but Jesus. So let me get really practical for a second. How do you do this in your life? 
What are the things that draw you back into focus? This is partly why we take communion every week, right? To re-center us on the cross, to re-center us on Jesus. <clears throat> Any of you who have been here for a while know that Jim talks about what he does is a daily Bible reading. He reads through the Bible every single year. That helps keep him focused. Others, it's loving their neighbor. And maybe it's not just... Uh, all neighbors in general, but it's that specific neighbor, that neighbor with a need right now, that neighbor who has a real big hurt in their life. Maybe it's praying uh, at certain times during the day and having a different prayer routine. Maybe it's serving in a ministry here at the church or around town. But we all need to know the goal when we run our race. And we need to understand as we train what keeps us on track in that goal. So pray about that this week. That's your homework. What is it that is working for you, keeping Jesus fixed and the focus on your life? And what isn't working? What maybe do you need to subtract and what maybe do you need to add? I'll leave that between you and God this week. But as I get ready to close, I want to tell you this story. I was at the Bluegrass Festival a few weeks ago. And I was sitting there enjoying the bluegrass music and I looked up and standing in front of me, was my cross-country teammate from high school. I hadn't seen him in 18 years. He's standing right in front of me. So I finally got up the courage to go say hey to him. We had a great conversation. We were catching up. I don't think his date appreciated it that much, though. <laughs> and he asked me, he said, do you still run? Now, he still runs. I, we, I keep up with him on Facebook. He lives in Crested Butte. He's an ultra-marathon athlete who trains and lives over there. He asked me, do I still run? And I thought about it for a second. Man, I would love to run. I'd love to do those ultra-marathons. And I've thought about it for a, a ton. And for me and for the stage of life that I'm in and not saying anything about anyone else and the decisions they've made, but for me, I've come to the conclusion it would be selfish. It would be entirely selfish for me to do such a thing because I know enough people who do these races and I know the hours of training it requires of them, the, the significant, significant investment in nutrition, uh, the way that family and work and finances all take a back seat while you work towards this goal. And to me, in my life, sounds like it would be an item. I mean, no one cares if you have that bumper sticker on the back of your car that says how far you ran anyways, right? So I told him, I don't run anymore. Because how do I explain to my friend who's literally a pagan that I need endurance for something different now? No longer do I need endurance for a sport, but I need endurance for faith. I need endurance for those times when I'm sitting at the park I'm like, man, this dad doesn't want us to go to church. Well, I know this dad. And I'm going to run with endurance because I'm working on this dad. And God is working on this dad. And we as el the elders and I have been praying for this dad. And this dad is going through a hard time. So the hope is that God would do something there that would give me the endurance to say, no, 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 God's going to write a different story. And maybe one day, this dad who doesn't want us to be around will say, I am so grateful these Christians are around my family. Thomas Long, who literally wrote the book on preaching, describes the Hebrew church like this. The weary congregation of Hebrews longed for a gospel without a cross, a redemption without sacrifice, a faith without pain, something pristine and holy, something that does not exhaust the faithful with calls to put one foot in front of the other in daily obedience. Something beautiful, like an image of God in an unspoiled heaven, surrounded by a lovely angel singing untroubled hymns. Anything! Anything but a weeping, suffering Jesus marching through the tragic history with his head bowed and his face blooded. But the preacher will not compromise the gospel. He will not reduce it to the power of positive thinking. In the coming chapters, the preacher will plunge us to the depths of the cross 
and into the daily sacrifices. But in the opening chapter, the preacher wants us to see the glorious heights. The glorious heights of the Son of God exalted as we gaze upon the cross. Before we leave, would not be doing my job unless I gave you this image. You, they say you climb a mountain one step at a time. I used to believe that until I met one of the best mountaineers that I've ever known. She was a mom from University Church of Christ in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. She was in her 50s with high school kids on the trip. She was a Walmart cashier who was about 5'5", five five, 245. When I met her, I thought, how is this going to work? One of her previous guides assured me, don't worry about her. She's going to be one of the best ones on the trip. And boy, was she right. She hiked most of the peaks overlooking this valley, half a step at a time, just like this, four inches. She never broke from that pace. She was the example of the tortoise of the hare and the hare example. Meanwhile, students would be running up ahead. They'd be dropping their packs. They'd be falling over, stopping, crying, complaining, even some of them puking with altitude sickness. And all the while, she kept her pace. She just kept on moving. And she always made it to the top of the mountains. And I'm sure when she went home, none of her coworkers believed what she had actually accomplished. But she never wavered because she always knew her goal. And her goal was always to make it to the top. But you know what? There's many everyday Christians just like her. Everyday Christians who live with incredible endurance. And for them, there may not be like ultramarathon athletes, people cheering at the end of the line and celebrating, but there are ones who are working faithfully, knowing that there is something greater that they may not hear or even understand in the moment, cheering them on. They know that Jesus was the goal of the Bible. They know that Jesus is the future that is one day coming, but most importantly, they know Jesus is the goal for today. That loving and following Jesus today is the goal. And when you come to understand that it is an amazing, beautiful goal, you see the glory in that. Even in the times when it is costly and it's difficult. So before we start living with endurance, before we start to unpack what this looks like, let me just ask you, can you fix your eyes upon Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith? Pray with me. God, we come to thank you for Jesus. Thank you for his example, for the actions he took on behalf of us to reconcile with you. So forgive us. Forgive us when we think Jesus is just too good to be true. Forgive us when we settle for a watered down or an off-brand version of Jesus. And forgive us when we get bored of Jesus. So may your spirit give us eyes to see that this is our brief moment in history to live with endurance, to make a difference. So let us run with our eyes fixed upon Jesus. Let us run with great joy, God, as we love you and we love our neighbors. Give us the strength to go the distance in order to pass on the baton to future generations of faith. We pray this all in the radiant name of Jesus. And the church said, Amen. Amen.